This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, dear brothers and sisters. Some readings of the Bible are rather easy to understand. They're pretty clear. Maybe a little background information is needed or a little teaching on some of the circumstances, but, but the main idea and lesson is, is pretty clear. Take, for example, the ten lepers. You know that account, right? The ten lepers and... Well, a, a pastor could give some background on the skin disease called leprosy. He could talk about the process for being declared clean again in, in society after having leprosy and, and things. But what's the main point of that story? Not only can Jesus alone cure leprosy, but how many came back to say thank you? Nine did not, but one, one did. We we're grateful to our Lord for his blessings. Or take the fall into sin. We can talk about what the names of the trees in the garden were and the background of the command of God and all the blessings he gave them so that the, his people should love him and follow his ways. But what's the point? The main lesson is that this was the event that ushered sorrow, sadness, sin, and its effects, even death, into the world. The disobedience of our first parents. Those lessons are pretty clear from those accounts. How about today's gospel reading? Did you get the point when we read that? It almost seemed like more of a shotgun kind of approach with a lot of things going on and a lot of lessons being said and a lot of references being made. What, what exactly are we supposed to learn from this reading from Luke chapter 17 today? Let's pull this together because there is a thread that runs through this reading that becomes very clear the more we think about it. And it's going to leave us praying the same prayer that the disciples prayed to Jesus in the middle of it. Lord, increase our faith. So today, let's walk through that thread of that reading and let's end up saying the same prayer that they did. Lord, increase our faith as we learn what, what Jesus teaches us. On this day long ago, Jesus was giving various instructions to his disciples. There were three main ones at the beginning. Perhaps you remember those. It said in verse 1, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. Okay, so the first lesson has to do with stumbling. It's interesting, in the Greek language, the, the word for things that cause people to stumble, that's one word, skandalizo. You, you hear the word scandal in there? In English, if we just Englishize the word, we would say, don't scandalize people. What does that mean? Well, one picture of the word skandalizo is that there's a trap set to spring. Set to spring quickly and catch something. And it says that you should not be the one who takes someone over and leads them into the trap so it springs on them. Another picture with this word is to stumble over something on the ground. If you scandalizo, and there's rocks on the ground and everything, and you, you hit one, it says, don't put rocks out and then lead someone through here so that you trip them up. What the point is, is that there are rocks on the ground out there. There are traps that, that are set here and there. And temptations will come. There are bad friends out there who will influence other people. There are bad examples in the world. But don't you be one. Don't you lead people into sin. And especially when it comes to children. Don't be leading children into sin. In fact, if you lead children into sin and into wrong attitudes, it's better to be drowned in the depths of the sea than to scandalize them. A second teaching was, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Speak up. This is like the sermon last week on making judgments, on speaking up about sin. We're supposed to speak up and rebuke our sinning brother, and by doing this, the, the sense of this is that we are honoring him and respecting him. The, the word for rebuking has the root word to honor. You care enough and honor him enough that you would say something if he's on a bad path. 
And then the third picture Jesus had was in verse 3, where it said, And if your brother comes back seven times in a day and says, I repent, you must forgive him. So seven times, someone sins against you. We don't even have to think this is the same sin, like they're making a mockery of it, but just seven, seven different things they do. They're kind of callous attitude that day. And you forgive them. So what was the disciples' reaction to Jesus' teaching that day? Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Why did they say that? Walking through those, those teachings of Jesus, do you, do you get the reasoning why they would have said that? Increase our faith. How easy is it to do those things? You know, if we take those things and we put them in our day and age now today, just think about that in your life. Don't be offending children. Don't be causing them to stumble. Don't be causing them to sin, especially the very, the very young. You be a perfect example for everyone in your workplace and everyone in your family and everyone in your neighborhood and everyone in your church and especially the young children. You be perfect in front of them. Lord, increase our faith. Tough assignment. Who can do that? After all, parents, moms, Dads, uncles, aunts, grandparents, have you always been perfect examples to others, especially children? Sometimes there are moments that come that are called whoops moments. Have you had any whoops moments? Uh, a whoops moment is the time that you, you slide a safety pin into your thumb or you drop that thing under the couch and now you can't find it or someone says something to you on the phone and so you, you get really mad and you say something or you do something and then you turn around one of your kids is there whoops how many whoops moments have you had how many times have you been a bad example to, to children or others around, around you we think of Maybe even times where we haven't had a whoops moment because we didn't want it to be a whip, whoops moment. Maybe we turned around and said, it's okay, I can talk that way because I'm mad right now and I'm a grown-up. I don't care. Or maybe we've even told them, you know what, we're going to be a little bit less than truthful today. Today you're nine because I don't want to pay the price for you getting into this park. Have there been times you have led someone into a sin? Lord, increase our faith. And how about rebuking our brother? Yeah, I think that's a logical thing. We, we heard about that last week with speaking candidly about specks when we have removed our plank from our own eye. But who really wants to talk to your uncle who has a potty mouth about his language? That conversation is going to be a little bit difficult, isn't it? Who wants to talk to your, your, your adult child who is very sparse in their church attendance and coming to communion? Who wants to talk to that relative who moved in with his girlfriend without being married yet? Who wants to have that conversation? People are running from those conversations. That's going to invoke wrath on you? Painful discussions. Lord, in increase our faith. And who exactly wants to repeat, have a repeat offender against you seven times in a day and forgive them? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that too. It's okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. I, I forgive you. Lord, increase our faith. And we realize how far we are from perfection when we realize Jesus could have pulled in a lot more commandments here. He just pulls in a few of his various teachings that day that made the disciples say, Lord, increase our faith. He could have brought in 8, 10, 15 other, other commandments about anger and, and greed and language and everything else where we've fallen short. So what's the solution? That was Jesus teaching that day. This is why we need to pray that. But what does Jesus say? He said in verse 6, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted into the sea, and it will obey you. Jesus points at a tree that's near them and says, By the way, if your faith is this big, you can make trees move. That sounds pretty random. What, what does he mean by that? You might remember that a mustard seed was one of the smallest seeds that farmers planted uh, in their yards or in their gardens. Little tiny seeds. This is not a compliment. 
that he's given them. He's saying, if you've got faith this big, you can do these things. In fact, you can make trees jump into the ocean. Now, he's not telling us to plant trees in the sea. But in his metaphor, what he's saying is, this is not a big assignment. This is a little thing. This is not a big assignment at all. And it's not a big assignment, not because of your power and your great faith and because of your virtue and piousness, but because of the power that you're plugged into. You have the Holy Spirit living in you, like we've heard in Bible class the last couple times. Holy Spirit, the, the power of God living inside of you, motivating you. If you have faith this big, you can do bigger things than I'm talking to you about today. I, I think if we look at those examples in Matthew 25 on Judgment Day, that, that would become clear, where Jesus says when he judges the, the righteous in a favorable way, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did to me. That's on judgment day. When Jesus talks about the good works that show faith, these things that naturally come because you are orange trees, just producing oranges like we heard in the children's message. Jesus does not say, come into heaven because you swam across the English Channel, because you, you went to the moon, you invented the microwave oven, you made unheard of science experiments. Someone was hungry and just said, can I give you something to eat? Whenever you did that for one of my brothers or sisters, whenever you did that for one of God's people, you went up and talked to them. You asked how they're doing. You asked if they need help. Simple acts of mustard-sized faith. So your brother's on a wrong path. Go talk to him. Someone needs forgiveness. You forgive them. Don't lead people into sin. If we think about it, these are basic things. It would almost be as if you're the, the JV coach and it's time for fall sports again. And you come out there and you got your new crop of JVers out there and you say, hey, take a lap. We're going to start practice. Take a lap. And they come back after taking a lap and they're going, oh, wow. I don't know if I can take this season. It's just, wow. Tremendous assignments. All the strenuous things I just went through to take a lap. You're going, you took a lap? It's going to be a lot worse than this. A lot more strenuous. These are the basics. This is not a big assignment. And we see our motivation for following these ways when we see what Jesus did. This isn't a sermon in how to or find your own strength, but Jesus Christ did these things perfectly, did he not? He always welcomed the little children. Jesus always spoke up to people tactfully about their sin or more forcefully if he needed to. Jesus always forgave those around him perfectly, even on the cross where he was being nailed there and said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then he took those sins of yours and mine to that cross, and he paid for them in full. This is our motivation, the Savior who has won forgiveness for us, who died and rose again so that we could have that place in heaven and so that we could show good works that simply show the kind of tree that we are. Jesus had one other thing to say besides, this is not a big assignment. He also said in verse 7, Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, Prepare my supper. Get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because of what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So not only does Jesus say, these, these are not big things we're talking about today. He also says, these things are also simply your place. They're your place. They're your call of duty as my people and as the tree that I have made you. You know, for example, if we take this to a more modern day illustration, if you've been to a restaurant lately, have you ever had a hostess taking you to your table and you say to that person, hold it, hold it, have you eaten? Hold, did you get supper? Maybe you should get supper first before we get seated. 
Or have you had a waiter waiting on you there and they come up and they're ready to take your order and you say, oh, have, have you had your break? Maybe you should take your break and then come back and, and get our order if you haven't had your break, if it's been a busy day for you today. I don't know any of you who have ever said that. What kinds of things are you saying to the waiter? You forgot the lemon in my wife's water. We need more napkins here, and his food was a little cold. Can you take care of this? How would you have the gall to say those things to your waiter? You are paying for their services, and that's their job. Maybe you've said that to someone on the phone once in a while. This is your job. Why don't you take care of this? We do this all the time. And what does Jesus say to you? What's your place in God's kingdom? Are you the master? Are you God? Are you the creator? Are you running the show? You're a servant. In fact, you're an unworthy servant. Jesus isn't saying you have no value. But you're a created creature and follower of our Lord. You and I are ones who have been placed here to, to serve him and love him. You and I are ones who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and given a new life of of purpose and faith now. That, that's our place. And so we just say, what well, we just produce oranges because we're an orange tree. We just do these things because that's the faith inside of us. And we don't look for kudos and compliments or medals or trophies as we do them. This is our blessed, joyful place in God's kingdom. So today, in a reading that might appear a bit random at first, may we end up praying, Lord, increase our faith when we see the, the full impact of what Jesus is teaching us today. Lord, increase our faith. May we see these commands as our basic marching orders and call of duty that, that we simply do because we're saved people. And in it, may we also see our Savior the one who did these things perfectly for you and me, the one who saved our souls, the one who served us in the best way. And may we pray, Lord, increase our faith. And as we do that, may we be saying, as our text ended, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Amen. Please rise.